Who has been to a startup grind before? Who hasn't been to startup grind? Awesome. Awesome. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming. So this is in, run in partnership with The Conductor and Google for Entrepreneurs. So it happens there are 200 chapters all over the world. Um, so we're really proud to have the Arkansas chapter here in Conway. So every single month we bring a local influencer or entrepreneur here to share their story with you guys. So it's a casual fireside chat, casual by design, so no PowerPoints are even allowed, um, just so that we can sort of talk and hear stories and not be connected to things. Um, and then there's a Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask questions. And then we do encourage you guys to be social and tweet about what Christina is saying and her life advice. Our hashtag is full steam AR. Um, and our Twitter handle is at AR underscore conductor. What is your Twitter? I am Christina M716, and that's my birthday. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's coming up. It's coming up. Um, yeah. So I'm sure when you start tagging it, everyone else will be tagging that as well, so it won't be hard to find. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So think about what you want to ask. And then, like I said, we encourage you guys to be social on Twitter and um, Facebook, too. Um, yeah, and I want to go ahead and do some thanks as well. So obviously, UCA, Startup Junkie, Conductor, Google for Entrepreneurs, Jack Evans is in the back doing the videography, and Keaton Ramsey helped me do everything today to get this ready to go. So thank you guys so much. All right, we're going to get started. So Christina. Yeah. Tell us who you are and what you do. Oh, my goodness. Um, can I do some background and kind of go Perfect. my life? OK. So the danger here is I talk for a living. So this is going to be where you might have to like, you know, give me this little clue, stop talking. You talk a lot. OK. Um, so I've always had a lot of fun with when people would come up to me and say, Christina Munoz, where are you from? I know what they're getting at. And I'd like to smile and say, South Dakota? That doesn't really answer the question. Okay, so how does the Munoz come from South Dakota? So my dad was born and raised in South Dakota, a town called Yankton. Only reason anyone might have heard about it. Do you know Yankton? Oh my goodness, wow, very cool. That's the pretty side of South Dakota. I was from the boring flat side. Uh, it's pretty now. Uh, Tom Brokaw is from Yankton, South Dakota. And so I jokingly say that's the real reason I got out of broadcasting. I was never gonna be the most well-known broadcaster from Yankton, South Dakota. So um, born and raised there, he was a violinist uh, by trade. I find it so interesting because uh, his family, his brothers and sisters are all chemists and scientists, and he saw a violin when he was 10 and was infatuated with it, and I'm so thankful my grandparents allowed him to pick it up, and he became a professional violinist, and he, teach, he taught uh, grades 4 through 12 in Yankton High, Yankton Public Schools, and then was in the South Dakota Symphony and the Sioux City Symphony for 40 plus years in each of them. So he got his um, undergrad at Yankton College, uh, that was in Yankton, and you know how a lot of parents want you to go where they went? Well, Yankton College is now a federal prison. He said, please don't go where I went. Uh, beautiful campus. And so he then got his master's in music at the University of Kentucky in Louisville. And after he graduated there, a friend of his said, I'm going to go in the Peace Corps for a couple of years. Why don't you come with me? He thought about it, life decision, he agreed to it, and I love that he was stationed in La Serena, Chile, and his mission was to build a music school. I love that, because when you think of peacekeeping missions, that's not necessarily the first thing you think of, and I think that's so cool. So my mother was in La Serena, Chile. She was actually, he played at her high school graduation before they met. She said she told her friends that she liked the gringo with the big ears, and that was my dad. And my sweet Sydney has the same big ears. Um, her hair covers them. So they met there. Uh, she was a dancer, actually, and her dance instructor was married to my dad's violin instructor. They had a party. Mom and dad met. They were married there. And we go and visit. And, you know, has anybody been to Chile? Gorgeous. It's a long, skinny one. Everywhere you go, you have mountains on one side, ocean on the other. I mean, it's just gorgeous. I think at its thickest, it's 120 miles. I mean, so it's a very long, thin country. And so we go there now, we visit and we go, oh, how did you guys ever leave this? It's beautiful. So you got to remember it was 1969 when they were married. In 71, the government was overthrown by the military. Very unstable. When you think about raising a family, you think of America and the opportunities there. So they, of course, decided to move back to America. I said, I don't think my mom was thinking South Dakota. Um, she was probably thinking LA, New York. It was January. And it was 29 below zero the day they moved. It's still a record low, actual temp. She didn't speak English, and she said she cried for six months, and it was just a very hard transition for her. But they had three daughters. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, everyone, it's Carolyn, Catherine, and Christina. Everyone says, are you C's or K's? And we're actually CKC because it's the Spanish spelling. We are Carolina, Catarina, Cristinita because I'm the baby. Still the baby. 
And uh, we grew up in a very artistic family. I call it the artsy fartsy family. My dad was a violinist, my mom's a calligrapher, she had dance. We all were dancers, singers, theater, this was our world. Um, I took it so seriously that when I was looking for colleges, I was looking for a musical theater degree. And so I went to different schools. I actually went to um, New York University and I was accepted and thought about it. I really wanted a big city and really what it came down to was at the time, um, so the um, tuition was $54,000 a semester. And University of Minnesota we had reciprocity with South Dakota, it was six. And so I went to University of Minnesota. <laughs> so um, that's how I ended up there. Uh, started as musical theater, did some community theater. And it's so funny, if my dream had been Broadway, I might still be chasing that dream. My dream was this Minnesota theater called Chanhassen Dinner Theater, about 30 minutes outside of Minneapolis. And I'd seen every show since I was five. Growing up in South Dakota, we go to Minneapolis, we go to Valley Fair, we go to a Twins game, we go to Chanhassen Dinner Theater. So this is where I wanted to be. And we all auditioned, and there were hundreds of girls that day. They took eight dancers, and I was one of the ones that got in. I was 19 at the time. It was a full-time job. We did the show Can Can. This is back when it was illegal to do the Can Can in Paris. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. I loved every minute of it. But we did, we counted one time. We did 98 kicks a show. It's about 100 a show, eight shows a week, 800 kicks a week, 302 performances of the same show. It was a 10-month run. And I kind of had one of these, I'm not sure I want to do this the rest of my life moments. It was fun, um, but I was the youngest, and I was the only one that could do all 302 performances every routine because there were injuries, which was crazy. Hip rotator cuffs were going out right and left. Your just body's not made to do that. Um, I would watch a lot of dancers. You retire, gosh, 25, 30, and they would either you know, go back to school or become flight attendants or go do something else, and I wanted something where if I work hard, I can work my way up. Um, I had done radio in high school, um, same radio station that Tom Broca had worked at. Actually, my sister now owns that station. She's in ownership, radio ownership, and uh, liked radio, so I switched my degree to broadcast journalism. It was almost a whim. It was like, ah, eh, that's the only other thing I kind of like. I'm doing this professionally, so I'm not, I don't need the degree necessarily, so I'm going to switch to broadcast journalism. So for the next four years, I perform professionally in Minneapolis. It's a great theater town, has lots of opportunities, and but really kind of started liking the broadcasting thing. I mean, that kind of became more of a niche. Um, I was getting married. I had met my husband at a radio station in South Dakota, and it didn't quite seem like a good fit. Um, it was one of those decisions. We were in Chile. We had a wedding ceremony for my mom's family in Chile. It was beautiful on the beach. My dad played violin. Uh, oddly enough, the, the guy that married my parents 33 years prior married us uh, on the beach, which is pretty cool. And we just decided, uh, my advisor at school had said there's an opportunity at WCCO, it's the CBS affiliate in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is considered a big market. I think you should take it. By the way, it's 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Okay, not ideal, but let's think about it. So I could have either auditioned for the next show or I could have taken this gig. And I knew if I wanted to get into the broadcast world, I had to get my foot in the door. So I came back and I took the job. And so now in the fall, I was working 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. Then I would go to school and then I would perform or teach dance at nights. It was insane. So I tell people now, people sometimes think things came easy to me and I want to be like, no, nah, I worked my tail off for this. And I tell college students, I'm not saying you need to do this because I wasn't sleeping, that's insane. But this is what I knew I needed to do to get to where I wanted to be in life. So I did that um, and actually I really believe I was sitting there, my shift was ending on 9-11. And to this day, I think it had a huge impact on why I wanted to go into the broadcasting world. Um, Minneapolis actually had an election that day and we had to decide, are we going to continue, are we not? It was very un unsettling. Um, and I remember it so well because everybody in a TV station usually have, used to have those big box TVs, they're, they're a little more technology driven now, um, on your desk. And the first plane goes in, and I'll be honest, it's a newsroom, we're, we're kind of used to death and destruction. Yeah, it's a big New York story but we all carry on. When that second plane went in, if you've been in a newsroom, they're very loud. You've got scanners, you've got phone calls, everything. It was silent for about these three beats, and then everybody just got up and started doing stuff going, okay, this is not a New York story. We are under attack, and what do we need to do? We had to get our governor on, we had to get our mayor on, and I helped with all of that, and I felt like I was helping inform the public at a very crucial time, and I know that motivated me to continue on in the broadcast world. So I did that for my senior year. This is what I always talk about so much when I talk to younger students is the concept of networking and how important that is. 
And I truly hate the saying, my kids tell me don't say hate. I truly dislike the saying, because they're not supposed to say hate. Um, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Because that makes it sound like, oh, you have a rich uncle, you're gonna be fine, and you can be really bad at your job, but you're gonna get it anyway. But I would say who you know does matter. Because every job that I've had, I had a contact, I had a connection, I had someone to vouch for me. Now when you get it, you darn well better back yourself up. And you better work your butt off when you get there. Um, so here I am, um, I got moved to the 10 o'clock show along the way, which is great, so I no longer had to do those awful hours. And um, so uh, there I was, hadn't graduated yet, though we didn't graduate till June because we had trimesters at U of M. And I get, somebody is on the assignment desk and he looks up at me and he says, hey, you want to be a reporter when you graduate, right? I said, yeah, why? I said, a friend of mine is a reporter in Duluth, Minnesota, so there's, that's the small market job. Every market you know, is numbered one through 210. One is New York, two is LA, three is Chicago, four is Philadelphia, all the way on. It's not really population, it's based on television sets and eyeballs, but similar to population. Duluth was market 136, so we call it a small market, but you want to start in a small market because you're going to make mistakes, and so it's better to have less eyeballs seeing you. I said, yes, I, I would be interested in being a reporter. He said, I'll make a call on your behalf because I had done a good job at that job. He calls that um, news director. I go up for an interview. I get the gig. Um, I started reporting before I graduated. I would report on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, drive back to Minneapolis, two and a half hours, go to school, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, drive back to Duluth, report. And I thought, hey, I didn't even go to my graduation because I was working, but I thought, this is why we get that degree, so I'm okay with that. Um, so we did that uh, for a year. And it was so funny because I was on a friend's tape at that point who got a job in Green Bay. Green Bay, Wisconsin would be the middle market job. It's market 69. It's a good opportunity. And um, I, I was offered the job there and I just thought it didn't seem like a right fit. My husband is a rock climber and in Minnesota there's great rock climbing. Green Bay's flat, so that's a problem for us. Uh, I'm a Vikings fan, I couldn't live in Packer country. Sorry, that just sounds crazy to me. So it didn't feel right, but I didn't want to say no. So I picked up the phone and I called the anchor that was in Minneapolis when I was there, and her name is Randy Kay. She's now on Anderson Cooper 360 on CNN. I said, where did you work your media market job? She said, KATV in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was only here 18 months. She got to cover Clinton election. And she said, uh, send him your tape. I said, well, there's no opening. She said, just send him a tape and I'll make a call for you. Great, so she does. My news director says the day he got my tape was the day they moved, you might know some of these names, Scott Inman was the weekend um, sports anchor. He became the five o'clock news anchor. Justin Acri, who is now on The Buzz, who by the way also came through Duluth, Minnesota, oddly enough, was a news reporter and he became the weekend sports anchor and voila, they had a news reporter opening. I come down, I interview. The crazy thing about this is I wasn't going to tell my news director because I wanted the weekend gig if I stayed. And yet the day before I leave for Little Rock, my news director puts up a sign in the newsroom that says, leaving in two weeks, going to KRK to be the assistant news director in Little Rock, Arkansas. He's from Bald Knob, Arkansas. Rob Heverling is his name, had no idea. And so I go into him and say, I'm flying to Little Rock tomorrow. He said, I used to work at KATV. He told me all about it. He told me the news director, he told me everything I needed to know. Came down, it went very well. The kind of aha moment for us was the rock climbing calendar that my husband had at the rock climbing gym flipped it. It was April 2003, beautiful rock climbing shot, and it said the Ozarks, Arkansas. Okay, well, we have a job opening and we have climbing. We're moving to Arkansas. Didn't know anything about Arkansas, had never been here. Um, my friends up north, when they gave me a going away party, they said they took away my shoes because apparently we're barefoot in Arkansas, ha ha, and gave me hillbilly teeth. <laughs> This is what people think. I can't control that, and I know you all know that. And it kind of makes me sad now, and I send them pictures of how beautiful this place is. I still think they don't believe me, but that's okay. Um, so we come down here, and I had people saying, y'all got an accent, where are you from? And I'm going, I have an accent? Um, it was very difficult at first. It was really hot. I had never experienced that in my life. And I kept thinking, if my mom can go from Chile to South Dakota, I can go from Minnesota to Arkansas. So it became home. Um, this, is the, this is the part of the story where when I'm sharing my personal story, which includes my testimony of faith, uh, I'm not going to do that, don't worry. I talk uh, more about this is when, oddly enough, it was 12 years ago today, um, I lost my dad to cancer. And it was very hard for me at the time going, why am I 800 miles away? Why am I here? This doesn't make sense. Um, I actually did turn away from God in that time, came back six months later. 
Um, but we had no intention of staying. I know you, you might have heard that before from people that aren't from here. Zero intention of staying. We even said, let's not make friends because it's hard to leave when you have good friends. Let's just not make friends. We're only going to be there two years and then we'll leave. It's been 14 years. So uh, what really happened was the broadcast industry changed. Um, in 2008, Channel 7 laid off 25 individuals. Um, everything was cut, everything was pulled back. And just, you know, think about it. Think about your own TV watching habits. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when we had three channels, maybe four if the antenna was working really well. And now how many channels do you have? You probably don't even know. 500? I don't know. So that's revenue that has to be split among all of those, or it all used to be split among three or four. They made a ton of money in the 80s and 90s. It's just not happening anymore. And it is sad. It's sad for journalism. It's sad for the industry as a whole. I feel for it, but nonetheless, it was changing. And I knew in that moment that longevity would be smarter than I could go be the morning anchor in Minneapolis or a weekend anchor up there, be closer to home. Well, who's going to be the next one cut in the next round of layoffs? Not the one that's been there the longest, the new girl. And so longevity suddenly made more sense. They let me anchor here. I signed um, a contract to continue anchoring, and we stayed. We never anticipated staying. Um, then we decided to have kids. And uh, boy, that changed the whole thing, too, because I remember you know, women would tell me, kids are going to change it. And I would be like, yeah, I'm not one of those women. No, I'm all about my career. And uh-uh. I was so wrong. I was completely wrong. Had these babies, which we struggled. We went through infertility for two years. I'm very public about that. And so when you finally have these kids, um, it, I'm going to go leave every day and work every night. So when they were babies, it was okay. I worked 1.30 to 10.30. But when she turned five, if she's at gone 8 to 3 and I'm gone 1.30 to 10.30, I am never going to see that little creature that I created. I'm not okay with that. So that's why I'm so thankful for UCA and so thankful for the opportunity here. I got here three years ago. They gave me the longest title in the world of titles, Associate Vice President for Communications, Public Relations, and Marketing. Um, but man, what a great turn of events for me to be in this beautiful campus, as you know, and talking about fun, wonderful things. When you have kids and you're missing the gymnastics and the soccer and the softball, and you're talking about a robbery that no one cares about or shooting down the street and an assault that is horrid, why? It just didn't make sense for me anymore. And that's why I had to walk away. And it's so funny, publicly, you walked away from the glamorous TV news job. I want to be like, really, not in the least. But that was the perception. And it was difficult. Um, people in the public still, oh, I just, I can't believe you're not at seven. I wish you were there. And I said, I, I, I like that you liked me, but I wanted to see my kids. And there was a lot of judgment there. So it was not necessarily an easy transition. Um, and to learn about higher education, to learn about a whole new industry, uh, there were definitely their challenges that involved. But see, I told you, I talk. See, this is what I do. So I just ramble along. So <laughs> that is that whole, how did you get here? Now, a little side note, Munoz. That is my mother's name. So why did I use Munoz? It wasn't, you know, back in the 80s, radio guys would always change their names. Well, that doesn't really happen anymore. But... Um, I had a contract as an as a actress. You have contracts with these agencies. And they just call you and say, hey, we got an audition. They need a 20-year-old Hispanic-looking female. Are you available? And you show up. I mean, it really is like that. It's crazy. And so mine lasted for about two years, typically. And there was a cable news station that I worked at as an intern when I was in college, writing stories behind the scenes. And I said, I'm ready to report. It was real ambitious. She said, OK, but a little nervous about a conflict of interest. So in news, you cannot, prov you cannot pr um, promote products or services, and you cannot be paid. So let's say, this never happened, I got a national commercial for Gatorade. And then that news organization had to do a story that Gatorade embezzled $5 billion. That's a conflict of interest. I can't be accepting money from an entity that we're doing a story on. The perception is you can't be unbiased. I think you could, but that's the perception. And so she said, how would you feel about changing your name? And I said, oh, okay, sure. I was ready to report. I didn't care. I should, sure. And I wasn't married yet. And she said, you know, diversity is real in right now. What's your mom's last name? <laughs> and I actually said, Cajado. That's her first last name. And I thought, gosh, that's going to be murdered. Calado, Calado. The other last name is Munoz. Ooh, yeah, do that. That sounds good. So I became Christina Munoz. Later, I was very thankful safety-wise. Um, you can't Google me. You can't find my address, my number. Um, as you, some of you may know, uh, two days after I gave birth to my sweet Sydney is when um, anchor and friend Ann Presley was murdered in her own home. At the time, we didn't know if he was looking for news anchors. He wasn't. He didn't know who she was. 
but we were terrified. So in that moment, I was very glad that my address wasn't out there, you couldn't find me, um, so it kind of became a safety thing. People assume that's why I did it, and it really isn't, it was the um, theater and advertising agency. So that is where Munoz comes from. So it's really funny when people will call my husband Mr. Munoz, because there's no Munoz in his world at all. <laughs> but he just says, oh, hi, yes, thanks, hi. <laughs> He's gotten used to it. <laughs> so there you go, that's me. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I am interested in your dance theater background. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about, so obviously that was a major pivot in your life, especially because you grew up in a theater, yes. musical, household. Talk about how do you still satisfy your sort of need for that sort of outlet, creative outlet? Let's start there. Oh my goodness, yay. Okay, so it was really hard. I mean, this was a piece of my life. I was so serious that when I was 16, I was this close to leaving high school and going to the ballet school in Omaha because it was hardcore. Um, I'm glad I didn't. It was really the social element that, that kind of bothered me. So, um, but yeah, when you just live it and breathe it, I was on stage since I was three, um, which I will say as a supporter of the arts, I believe I never would have been a broadcaster if I didn't have that background. It definitely gave me that skill set. I was really, really shy. I know that's hard to believe, but the shy kid that was on stage all the time gave me the presence I needed. So that's why I'm a huge supporter of the arts. Uh, everywhere I went, uh, when I was in Duluth, the Minnesota Ballet is actually housed in Duluth. They let me come take classes with them. And they were going to put me in a performance, and then I moved. And then when I got here, I, I was at my new my apartment in Little Rock, and lo and behold, the artistic director of Ballet Arkansas lived there. We meet. He said, you should come take classes. So I go take classes at Ballet Arkansas. I become a, a member of the board of Ballet Arkansas. Then I become the president of the board, and they let me be in the Nutcracker. I was Clara's mom for four years straight. And I loved it. It just And Channel 7 loved it. That was like a community involvement. Channel 7 would come bring cameras, which is really funny because the first time they came, one of the best bloopers, it's still on YouTube if you look, Scott Inman, I wasn't there because I was doing the Nutcracker, said, and tonight, yeah, a preview of the Nutcrapper. And the next day I had 10-year-olds all over going, he said Nutcrapper. I'm like, I know, I heard it. It was hilarious, really. So, um, But it was so cool that I got to do that crossover. And I haven't done it since I had kids, but this would be the first year I haven't decided anything, so don't start any rumors. Don't tweet this. Don't tweet this. But I always said I might go back once my kids are old enough, and this would be the first year that they could audition. So we're considering that might be time to go back to that. But um, the other thing I started doing when I moved to Conway, and this was really cool because I couldn't do this when I was in news, is somebody I knew my story, knew my background at church, and I go to the First United Methodist Church and say, we know you sing. Yes. Would you like to join the band, I, the praise band? And I actually said no because I wasn't willing to give a night. They practiced Thursdays at seven o'clock and I wasn't willing to give a night because I had just gotten my nights back. But I said, I could do like one a week if I can bring my kids to the practice. Sure, that's fine. They get to run around the sanctuary. They think it's a great time. And I sing one song a week with them. And then that evolved into the drummer has a dancer that takes classes in Little Rock. And as a drummer, he would bring in his cajon box every now and then and he would tap, he would beat a pattern and the tap dancers would have to tap the pattern. This is with the um, first professional tap company in Little Rock, she's in the junior company. And so they would do that from time to time. So they went to him and said, hey, we have a fundraiser coming up. Do you think you could get some of your musical buddies together and play music for us? I said, sure. So he asked four or five of us from the praise band, we get together and play. It was fantastic. We call ourselves Just Cause because we're from the praise band, so we believe we have a just cause. And why do we play? Just Cause. And so from that, we got another gig. And from that, we got another gig. And now I'm in a band. And it just cracks me up. I just never thought that I'd be able to do that. But again, in news, when do bands play? Eh, nights and weekends. When do news people work? Eh, nights and weekends. So I was something I, I thought I walked away from. And it was sad for me. And so now be able to, it is such a, why do we do it? It is so much fun to get together and jam with these people. We have stressful days here from time to time, I'll be honest. So when you can get, go home and once a week we'll get together in Stu Holt's garage and, and jam a little bit, it is so fantastic. So that's how I feed it, that's how I feed it. Now the fun thing is, this is very personal, when my dad died, I cut out classical music and I cut out violin, I used to play violin. And it was just too sad for me, it was one of those, <laughs> playing violin in a world where my dad doesn't exist didn't seem right and I shut it off. And it's really interesting how the mourning process works. I have mourned, but I didn't mourn the violin and the loss of that in my family. So every time I heard violin, I would just start crying. So the praise band one day said, hey, there's a violin part in this song. Would you want to try? 
oh my goodness. And I really prayed about it and thought about it and I picked up the violin, I tried, and I just bawled my eyes out. I mean, I could not handle the sound of the violin again. But what a cool opportunity because I know my dad would be proud. I picked it up, I learned the song, and I've since played with the band, the praise band, and I've played with our band as well. So that's like a huge pat on my back <laughs> because that wasn't easy. It was just too emotional. Wow. So. so um, on the note of being a music major, so this is really funny because the Jeff Sandridge, who's a composition conductor, was also a music major, yeah. or at least yeah. started out as that kind of transition. Of course. Can you just, yeah, can you just talk a little bit about what, like, what did you learn from that? Absolutely. And it's so funny because I was talking too about my boss is Chief of Staff Kelly Erstein. He's from Sheridan. Woohoo. I said it's not Sheridan, it's Sheridan. Okay. I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, he was ready to go to Henderson and that was the plan. It was closer to home, that's where he was gonna go. He got a music scholarship here because he happened to have his euphonium in the car when he was touring and they said, oh, you play, you want to audition? And he did and that's why he came to UCA and now he's chief of staff of UCA. Like none of that would have happened if it weren't for this instrument sitting in his car. And I love that because it's just so pivotal, you know, to, to what we do and what we learn. And, if you pay attention and you know if there's any arts teachers or anybody who teaches in the arts, I actually voted absentee the whole time I lived in Minnesota, in South Dakota, because almost every time there was a referendum or some sort of measure that we, my dad would have likely lost his job. It didn't say that, but you know arts are usually the first thing cut. And if funding wasn't continued, I knew my dad's job was always on the line. Now he was fine, um, but there's research after research after research of the benefits that any artistic teaching can give you. And I'm not trying to knock sports. I love football. I love sports. I love all those different things. Those give you great skills too. And there's a ton of football players that take ballet, by the way. Balance, flexibility, it's very important. Um, and so to me, any of those, like theory even, I love theory because I love math. They go hand in hand. And I mean, if you can't get a kid to learn math because of whatever reason, and you teach them music, you're teaching them math. Like, there's just so much crossover. And I'm so passionate about making sure that people have music, which though I love. I support Blackbird Academy here. You know, they are intentionally a nonprofit, which is really hard. Dance studios are never nonprofit because it's really hard. But they never wanted finances to get in the way of somebody getting exposed to the arts. And I love that. She's a UCA grad. But I love that concept. It is so important to me. I'm not taking away from any of the sciences. And I love that STEM has become STEAM. Like, this is a real thing. I'm not making this up. I love that because there's a little A in there for arts. And I get very excited by that. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about the value of knowing people and how you sort of have connections at a number of jobs. What advice would you give people who are looking to make to build those relationships right now? Um, this is hard for certain personalities because I am an extrovert. Uh, I used to be shy. I no longer am. I love social. I love being around people. Networking comes very easy to me. But you can be a business owner and still network. You just have to be a little more creative. I just think it is so important. The two things that I think are so important when it comes to that, because it does matter who you know, that's not the only thing that matters, but it matters, is also that burning a bridge thing. Um, it's so tempting, you know, you're done with these people, you're leaving, you really want to let them know what you thought, oh, that person is suddenly your boss six years later at a different job, you know that. I mean, it happens. I could give examples, but I'm going to be really nice to these people that I'm thinking of and not, because it was a really bad decision on their part, and I know that they didn't get a job based on how they treated their former coworkers. How sad is that? Um, so that absolutely matters. That is your community, that is your network. Um, I, I just, I never, here's why it mattered so much to me. These stats are old, but back when I was looking for a job as a reporter, the average amount of people that applied for one reporter opening position was 200. They would get about 200 tapes, this is VHS tapes, so you can tell I'm old. Uh, they'd get about 200 tapes for every opening, and the, ran, the average news director would push eject at eight seconds in. That's the kind of competition you're up against. That's why it was so important to have that connection and to have that phone call and to have that person. Um, I don't want you to ever go, Uncle Bob, will you call and get me that job? That's not what I'm saying. So please hear me when I talk about that networking and connecting. It is not assuming you're gonna get something because you know somebody, not ever. But if you can set yourself apart from the pack, 
you're gonna do better. And now that I hire people, it's really hard. People kind of say, well, you shouldn't hire someone you know. Okay, so you're gonna look at the 60 some applications that you have in front of you and randomly pick somebody that nobody knows? It's kind of smart to know somebody in the mix or to have somebody that knows somebody. Because I can say, I worked with that person and they are such a hard worker. Or I worked with that person, you don't want them. So, I, I mean, and in state government, we have to be very, very careful. We are not hiring buddies. But it's really hard to hire someone that you don't know based on a Skype interview and a piece of paper. I don't think so. I call, yes, I call references, but I also call people that they worked with that are not on there. Every job that I have ever given. Okay, and I have found out some things about people <laughs> that they probably didn't want me to find out. And it's that, not talking about crossing lines or anything there, but just, hey, what was she like to work with? A coworker, not a boss. So it really, really matters. <laughs> Um, boy, that's very good because I was told when I got here, I, I have nothing to back this up, I was the first on-air Hispanic in Little Rock. Kind of surprised me, but yet I never really cared. Um, that's great. I'm not going to downplay it. We can celebrate that because it's cool, but I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for being good, being good at my job. And so that's kind of a title and anytime you have that kind of superficial title, it's a little bit of a judgment going on there. Even though it's a good judgment, I didn't feel like that should matter. And everyone's like, oh, let's do a story, and let's do this. I'm like, eh, kind of a funny side note. One of the first stories that I was signed when I got here was do a story on Cinco de Mayo. I said, I can Google it, but I have no idea what that is. That's a Mexican holiday. I'm not Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, those little uh, stereotypes and perceptions that are put out there. So I worked my tail off. I wanted to be known as a good reporter and work myself up to a good anchor. Not, she's pretty good for the first Hispanic. You know, because that's a negative connotation. Yeah, I'm like, that's not cool. That's not what I want to be known as. Um, so you absolutely have to work your tail off. There is no easy way. I once heard somebody say, I don't care if you're cleaning toilets. You be the best toilet cleaner you can possibly be. And I teach that to my kids today. I mean, that is just, it's not a matter of who does what. Um, I've always hated when, and you see this in newsrooms, there's a little bit of that diva stereotype that exists. Someone that treats the general manager and news director different than the crew that's cleaning your, the desk. We got to know the cleaning crew fantastically because they were there at night, and I was there at night. And they became part of our family. They had an anniversary because they had been there for 30 years. And I mean, if you're too good to you know, take time to get to know them, then you gotta check yourself because it is all about that grit. And let me tell you, I was in for a little bit of a rude awakening when I got to higher education. It is different than anything. There's not a lot about TV news that prepared me for that, to be totally honest. Scott Inman and I have stayed, um, stayed close and stayed in touch. He's a good friend of mine, and we have shared stories about what it's like to get out. We actually, jokingly, we were work husband and wife for, gosh, 11 years. We sat next to each other in the newsroom, sat next to each other at the desk. I saw him more than I saw my real husband. So, um, And he made a comment like, we talked about the, the skill set in journalism is so specific that we didn't have a lot of other skills. We jokingly would always say, we know a little about a lot, but we don't know a lot about any one thing. And he said, I didn't even know the skill of calendaring. Because we didn't have to. We show up, we do the news, 5, 6, and 10. You don't have to calendar anything. And so it's just a very interesting, he is working his tail off. He's a financial advisor. Any of you in the business know you got to go work. You got to go find your clients. You got to go do all these things. We were in a cush little uh, newsroom. I will tell you, reporters are working their butts off. Anchors, it's a good gig, I'll be honest. We tried to pretend it wasn't at the time, but it really is. Now we're pulled in a million directions because you got a promo shoot over there and you got a community event over there. That's not hard work though. And so it's different than when you get here. It may not be pulled as many directions, but it's hard work, personnel management, things that I had never done. Man, I have learned a lot, but I was willing to put in the work. I put my girls to bed at 8, 8.30, guess what I do? I go to work. <laughs> That's just the way it is. It's just the gig. But at least I get to be with them from five to eight. So follow-up question to that, yes. too, because, so if you talk a little bit about your work-life balance, and then also on that note, because you're raising two daughters, so how do you 
how do you, what kinds of skills do you teach them about being sort of a female in the workforce or even a professional? You know what I mean? Like, how, how do you raise two young people? <sighs> okay, I'm going to say I'm a failure. I am a failure, and I felt so much better at that. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis. I read an article recently, I need to share it, that said, there's no such thing as work-life balance. Are you kidding? It doesn't exist. We all need to just let that idea go. And I felt so much better, because balance infers that everything is here. I've never once had a day like that. We've got kid things, and work things, and everything all over the place. Um, my eight-year-old is one of those like super cautious, careful kids we, I don't think, even had a bruise. Five-year-old, conversely, by the time she was four, we had been emergency room twice, overnight hospital stays uh, three days twice, surgery, stitches, and glasses. By the time she was four. I mean, she's just a little wreck, and she's just the sweetest little thing in the world. So that, in the middle of work, completely threw me, because there was no consistent, when she gets, she has a, it's a breathing issue, and so when she wakes up, uh, unable to breathe. It's very scary. Very, we've done this 12 times now since she was 18 months. And that's what the surgery was for. But all that to say, I thought I was so into my job and so into, whew, none of it mattered. In a blink of an eye, none of it mattered. Balance? There was no balance. It was all my girl. And then there are times where things happen here. It's all here. And now I'm probably more fortunate than a lot of working women out there is that my husband's a stay-at-home dad now. Um, when we were both working full time, he worked at the rock climbing gym in Little Rock. He helped manage it for about nine years. So we both worked nights. Well, that's great without kids. We'd get home about 11, 11.30, watch some TV, have dinner, go to bed about two, and just wake up not, whenever. It's great until you have kids. You know, there's not daycare for six to midnight, and if there was, you wouldn't want it. So he went part-time on the first baby, <laughs> and we had a babysitter come during the day, and when the second baby was born, he stayed home. And so... That's an interesting um, situation to kind of teach to my kids because they think that's normal. And when they saw some dad working, they said something about, yeah, but the daddy was in a suit. And they thought that was weird. And I thought, how cool that, you know, we're teaching this without even realizing we're teaching this. Um, that that's okay. That that's, you know, not weird. It's rare enough around here that if Dave takes the girls to a park, he feels like the creeper at the park. Why is this dude hanging out with a bunch of kids? They don't know he's their dad. So there's stereotypes that go with that too and that go the other way. There's stereotypes about me. You have two kids and you work full time? There's judgment there. I have had to throw my hands up and say, I don't care. And that's hard for me. I am a natural people pleaser. There's a little meme I love that says, I'm a recovering people pleaser. Is that okay? And that is so me. And I have had to go, I, I don't care what they think. I am teaching my kids about the importance of work. What I have basically done is five to eight, I realize I'm here right now, <laughs> five to eight is family. And at first I was present because I left Channel 7, but I wasn't present because I was here. Um, and I've had to find a way to get away from that. I fail. I fail a lot. Something's going on. I fail. But for the most part, I have been able to take out five to eight, and that is my family time. I was at a conference for, um, for UCA, and one of the guys was great. is called uh, Five Gears or Fifth Gear, and he has a book. If you want to look it up, I don't remember his name, but he was fantastic. And he shared a scenario that I went, oh, that is so me. He said, you know, he's on his phone, he's talking to his attorney, he's on his way home, and there's all these things in his mind. He gets out of the car and he gets his home, and he literally gives his kid a stiff arm. He gives his kid a stiff arm because he's not done on the phone yet. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, you know, and finishes up the phone call and then gives him a hug. And his wife called him out on it lovingly. And um, he had this realization that we are in gears and that our balance in life will be much better if we clearly mark those gears. So, like, gear four might be really, really working. Gear two might be social. And gear one might be family. I don't remember the numbers themselves, but the point was he now stops at a gas station, finishes whatever phone conversation he's on, hangs up, thinks about what his kids might have been doing that day, and then drives home so that he is in the family gear when he gets home. Huge for me because I was doing that every night. Just one more phone call. I just got to get one more phone call and I got to get this done. And I don't do it anymore. And so maybe there's something I should have gotten done that I didn't. That's why I fail. I fail daily. And I think if more people heard that, they may not feel so bad when they end that day going, man, I either didn't do my job as well as I should have or I didn't take care of my kids as well as I should have. It's not possible, so stop trying. Just do your best.
that's my advice. I love it. Um, so we're about to open up to Q&A, yes. but I do, can you talk a little bit about UCA a little bit? So, yes. Um, go ahead and do that. Tell us kind of what you do during the day and where yes. do you think UCA is going the next time? Ah, okay, I got 30 more minutes, right? Just kidding. Okay, so <laughs> this has been so much fun to me because um, I have learned a ton. Um, I love research, and we did a lot of research when we first got in here. And we learned a lot about what this, what was going on here. Now, I don't have to tell most of you, UCA had been through some tough times. And the media was really harsh on them. I was probably one of them. So, um, they had some issues. They had some uphill battles. And I, I know without a doubt that's a big reason why I was hired. Uh, you kind of have this concept of, well, if she's well-liked and respected in the state, if we attach her to UCA, maybe UCA will be well-liked and respected in the state. I get it. I mean, and that's a great idea. I had no idea what all I was in for. And I think it's because there's so much that falls under us. Uh, let's see if I get them all. We have media. That's a lot, depending on the day. Social media, huge, with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And we added Snapchat. I was super hesitant about the Snapchat thing because in news, all I had ever done is how people were using it for inappropriate purposes and deleting inappropriate photos. Um, but they brought the research to me and said 77% of college-age kids use it on a daily basis, and less than 2% are using it for horrific um, purposes. OK, well, we need to go where our, our prospects are. So we need to go there. So we snap. I'm still not cool enough to figure it out, man. I have it on there so I can follow what we do at UCA, but I don't, I've never snapped in my life. Um, so media, social media, all video, all photo, all web, web content, not the IT side, and then creative services. Now, that's a fun one because that means any poster, brochure, flyer, anything out on this campus. Think about 11,000 students, 2,500 faculty staff, um, all creating their own things. And I remember President Tom Courtway saying, this brochure is really bad. This can't happen. Well, somebody in math made it. I don't know. I'm not picking up math. Um, so centralized communication was a very difficult challenge because, and I think all institutions are like this, we tend to work in silos. You know, you have your own individual. I believe that UCA was worse than the average institution because the administration had scandal after scandal after scandal. They said, you guys aren't doing it right. We're going to do it our own way. And I don't blame them. But then I come in and say, let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya and work together. There was some resistance. And that was a huge challenge. So we at UCA had to decide, and are still deciding, who are we and what are we? We can't always be all things to all people. Um, but that's kind of what we were trying to do. And here's what's such a challenge. Um, compared to U of A, we're smaller. And we're fine with that, but we're smaller. Compared to somebody who grew up in small town South Arkansas, we're huge. So how do you promote that? How do you say, we're the big school for you, and no, we're smaller than them? It's really hard. So that's what we struggle with, and that's what we do. We also have a um, large contract with an advertising agency, which we had to do an RFP when I was here. Proposals were sent in, and Eric Robin Isaac was, was the chosen group. They have been fantastic. They have gone so much further than, ah, let's do a commercial, which is kind of what we did before to this target marketing and digital marketing. Now, I was the first one to go, commercials, woo, these are really expensive. I know how much these TV commercials cost. Why are we doing it when we know viewership is down and people are using their phones? Well, it's gone down from 93 to 86%, but it's still the beast. It's still the monster. It's still where most people get majority of their information. It is decreasing. But that's why we spend, when you look at our budget, and we spend a lot of money on TV commercials because that's that overall image and awareness. When you think about audience, gosh, if you're selling grills, you know who your audience is. We have parents as an audience, grandparents that are raising teenagers as our audience, and then 16 and 17 year olds as our audience. And you have to formulate something for all of them it is a huge task. Um, I think people still don't know exactly what I do on a daily basis. And sometimes I come in going, ooh, I got time to do stuff. Whew, when the day goes away, um, freedom of information requests are crazy. And you know that the law says you have to respond immediately. It doesn't say you get three days. It says if the information is off site, you can have three days if needed. But immediately, how do you describe immediately when we have some big meeting going on that I have to be at and a phone call saying, get me that document, get me that now? It was a huge challenge. So all those things together, I would argue a school this size could have someone over communication, someone over marketing, and someone over PR. So to take all of them on has been the reason it's a little, it's a little insane. 
Um, we are very excited and hopeful for enrollment in the fall. We, took, we did drop last year, and it was the first time we had dropped in a long time. All schools but two in the state did, and the major key here is high school numbers went down for the first time in about 18 years. Nobody really knows exactly why, but if you have less high schoolers graduating, you have less of a market. And um, so we knew it was coming. We also increased our academic standards. That's a huge decision. And here's kind of what we did, um, and Axiom was a big part of this and kind of helped us see this, is that generally speaking, we were getting a little bit, you know, there's drugs on campus or there's a fight on campus, um, and it's not always, um, let's say, the best of the best of kids, and those kids aren't graduating. And here's the thing about higher, higher education. The worst thing we can do is have you enroll and you not walk out of here with a degree and now you have debt. It is just disgusting to me. And that happens all the time. We have a graduation rate of 40%. Now we're trying to get that to go up. But how do you get that to go up? You don't let kids enroll that don't have any of them to go all the way. That sounds harsh, but we are doing you a huge disservice. This was before the new funding formula. You know, a year from now, we are going to be getting our state funding based on our performance. So this is in line with that, and that's fantastic that we did that, but we did not do it because of the funding formula. We don't get that much from the state anymore anyway. But, you know, I mean, that matters. But we want to graduate the kids that we get in. So we said, you know, what does their average kid look like that is successful here? By successful, we mean you enroll and you graduate. And they were, we, we got kind of information about what that looks like because those are the people that we want. We don't have this huge market. We can target that down and find those people. What matters to them? And that's what we're doing. So it's been a huge challenge. Um, the state is another thing where legislators, generally speaking, don't think any money should be spent on advertising. You know, we're here to educate students. I would agree, but if you don't have butts and seats, who are you going to educate? And so that is why we have to put that out there. We have to let people know what we are doing and why. We don't call it advertising. It's a recruiting budget. We are recruiting people to come here. We want the kind of people. The other thing we're doing is these two plus two transfer agreements because those are those people that go from high school and go, eh, I don't really know if a four-year college. We don't want you to sign up. We really don't. It has to be a good fit. Maybe you go to a two-year tech school, wherever that may be, and you do really well, and you realize you need that four-year. Well, now you can transfer here. The two plus two agreements allow the credits to transfer, and then you can get your four-year degree instead of coming here for two years and dropping out. So they're doing all these things to really try to help because in, in all honesty, I worry about the higher education industry as well. Here I am saying the broadcast industry is probably not that stable. Well, I think it can be like the uh, housing bubble. At some point, and you guys all know this, you can't keep increasing tuition if salaries aren't going up too. Well, I can't control salaries. But the demands that students are making today, workout facilities, dorms that are really cool, how do you pay for those? State funding has continuously gone down or stayed flat. When you think about that, I used to think the president of a university, oh, that's a cush job, that sounds like fun. He could be making a million bucks and it wouldn't be enough. It is just way more complicated than I ever gave it credit for. So, we're doing the best we can. Yay, yes, he is so fantastic. Houston Davis joined us on January 23rd. And when I say that, I mean, I sit here and go, uh, Tom Courtway is the person who brought me here. I owe everything to Tom Courtway. Uh, but Tom is so funny, he never wanted that gig. You know, he did it to stabilize us and to bring back integrity. And that's exactly what he did. And he did it with just gold stars. I mean, he was the perfect person to do that because man, let me tell you, reporters tried. There's not a skeleton in that man's closet. They looked for him. They couldn't find anything. So he was the perfect person to bring back that integrity. But what Houston brings to the table is he is young and excited and ready to move us forward. So we needed that stabilization time to get back on track. Houston comes from Kennesaw State University. And it's so funny because we talk about, you know, oh, UCA has got some background. We've got some baggage. And we try to fill them in, you know, and he knows all of it. And he said, I once had to fire four VPs on the same day. I'm, I'm good. Good. We've got this. Kennesaw State went through some troubles. And um, he was the interim president because the governor there assigned, appointed, gave the job to the uh, attorney general there. It was not received well. Now, he's doing a good job, but faculty was mad, students were mad, there were protests everywhere because it was a political move. Um, so he's not 
he's not for, uh, you know, he's, that's none of that is foreign to him. He's not afraid of that. Um, reporters and anything you know, like, you know, compared to where he's been, it's been fine and great. He is so intelligent, so smart, and so ready to move this place forward. So we are in that prime, perfect position to just go be awesome. So it's, it's really fun right now. Yes. So the answer for me and my team is we don't. It is all an international engagement. So international engagement is you know a group of us on this campus, um, a division, and they are the ones. Uh, they went to Argentina last summer. We have a lot from Argentina. Uh, they went to. Where was the other one they went to recently? I want to say it was the Middle East. Um, because I can't remember which country. There's a country there that the government pays for your higher education, even if it is in the United States. Well, gee, that's fantastic recruiting ground. I wish it were my job, um, but it's not. And it's amazing how true that word of mouth thing is because they'll go and get one or two students maybe from a foreign country and next year we'll have like 30. It's just hilarious because they were telling somebody, I had a good experience at UCA. And international, they're looking for higher education that's better. And so I, they do a great job. That was one way that we go, okay, well, if high school numbers locally are going down, where do you get more students? International is a great option. Problem is it's expensive. It's expensive. So I'm waiting for the day that we go, we need students from Chile. We definitely need some students from Chile. And I will sign up and be on that trip. <laughs> I love that, and I never thought that I would say what I'm about to say because I was, always would have thought it would be about um, their portfolio, their qualifications, maybe their years in the industry or, or whatever that may be. None of it. After seeing personnel issues and how a team works together and how one bad apple can ruin an entire mojo of a team, I want that person to fit in. They need to have a cool personality that is so discretionary. And so that's just not even a fair thing to, to tell people that are trying to be cool in an interview. But that personality thing, that personable thing, and it doesn't mean extrovert. The last one we hired was much more of an introvert, but we said, he will fit in with our team. And we've had enough, I guess, issues in the personnel world that that matters hugely, especially for creative people. Creative people need to be in this warm environment, this atmosphere. You need to be able to go to the park and chill with these people so that you can get your creative juices flowing. Might be a little different than a tech world. Um, but man, that really matters to me. And I mean, I know that we have not hired people, might have a great portfolio, but we go, that personality will not fit in with our group. Little egotistical, little too edgy, maybe. Edgy's not always bad, but it depends. Do we already have an edgy person down there? Well, we don't want another one because they're gonna go head to head. And so it's just, I never thought I would say that. I just always thought it would be about the quality of work. That has to be there. So we're talking about all the people that have the same quality of work. What's gonna make the one do this? That fitting in personality. So before we hire anybody, we usually have a committee, two, three, four people on that committee. They go down and meet our whole team. And it's a team of nine. And boy, I listen to that. When that person leaves, what'd you think? What did you think? Did you, did you get a good feel? Did you get a good what, What'd you think? And that's really what I'm looking for is that connection. And we have completely changed. I left that room thinking, oh, I think so-and-so is going to be number one. And we went downstairs. She did not gel. And she didn't get the job. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's hard. Sorry. I saw your hand. Um, I wanted to first commend you on how courageous you are in telling your story. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you get that courage? and being able to tell your story so, so well. I don't know, I don't think of myself as courageous. So I kind of go, really, am I? I mean, I just share it. I just share it. Um, Faith-wise, I believe I have been called to share, and that's why I get asked to speak at churches, at Bible studies, and I go share, because I believe that's my ultimate calling on this earth. Uh, I have to be a good mom, and I have to be a good employee, and I have to be a good, all these other things, but that is my, what I believe is my calling. 
Um, outside of that, I really, that's a tough one. I don't feel courageous. I feel talkative and I talk easily in front of people. I know that this can scare some people. A microphone and, and for example, I use Scott Inman because he was this fantastic broadcaster and he could look at a camera and broadcast all day. He doesn't like being in front of a crowd. And I find that so funny because it's just such an opposite thing. I don't mind a camera and I don't mind a crowd. Well, for him, they were very different. And he's technically shy and he's actually an introvert and he's just not as good at sharing outside of that camera. And so we would talk a lot about that kind of thing. So I do think it is a quality and I again have to give it up to theater. Theater gave me that theater and dance. I got up on stage and it's like when I met somebody that had never been on stage, I was like, that was weird to me because I'd been on stage all my life. And I know without a doubt that being on stage gave me that presence to go be able to do this. So even if it's not your full-time job, theater or anything, I just strongly encourage involvement in the arts, especially for kids. I mean, they're gonna, and if it's softball or soccer, that's great too, but for me to be able to present and speak on a stage um, is what gave me the ability to do this. So if I had to go down to one, um, this may not be the case for everybody, but as a news anchor, you're generally pretty well liked. And if not, they don't watch you. You can watch a different channel. Though if you're, they're watching you, unless they like the weather guy instead of you, chances are they like you. As a people pleaser, that mattered to me, if I'm just being honest. Um, there's an ego that goes with that. Just to be completely honest, and Scott and I have talked about this a lot, we didn't notice it then. We thought we were humble. We thought we had this. When you are in public, you're treated differently. Just the way it is. And it's so interesting. Reporter in a small market, you get recognized a little bit. It takes a lot. There's not a lot of viewers. We were third place station. We didn't even show up on the rating. That's how few people we had. So it didn't happen that often. You get here and you have a bigger audience. Channel seven's number one. But as a reporter, you think about it, you really gotta know that reporter to recognize them because you see them about 10 seconds before their story, 10 seconds after their story. That's not a lot of FaceTime recognition. So it takes you to get a little more recognized. When you start anchoring, you are suddenly the face. And suddenly everybody recognizes you. And this is why I believe child stars can't be normal. They can't be. They're treated differently. And if you're treated differently, you respond differently. Well, guess what? I was treated differently. People didn't mean to. But we as a society, there's a, there's a psychological um, research project here. People like to be associated with famous people. It's the weirdest thing. It's why we take selfies when we run into someone famous. It's why we want backstage passes. We like to be associated with famous people. And people thought we were famous. And so they would treat us differently. When you're in PR, you are just another person looking for attention on the news, in a paper, or some event. And I'm just like everybody else. And people that treated me a certain way treat me differently. And that was really hard for me. I had a friend of mine that always said, people are nice to you because of who you are. And I was like, that's not true. They're not because you're Christina Munoz. They're nice to me because they like me. I was proven wrong. She was right. And personal development wise, that was very hard. And in an institution of higher education, there was a little bit of a, who's this news, TV news chick and what does she know about higher ed? And there were people who didn't like me. And I'm just being honest, that was hard. And I have grown so much in personal development for me. Now that's not a real good standard. Not People aren't going to be super recognized in maybe what they're doing. So it's not a real good standard. But one thing I wanted to mention when you talk about going from media to here that has been super beneficial for me is I know their secrets. <laughs> and I use them against them, okay? So 
Story ideas. Story ideas are the backbone of a newsroom. And it's something that is a skill set. I wasn't super good at it. There are people that came into our meeting, our, our editorial meeting every day, and they said, I got three good turnable news stories. Fantastic. I could be like, I got one in the newspaper did it. That's not a good story idea. So we were constantly struggling for these story ideas. So here's the thing about TV news. If you're in a newspaper and it's a slow news day, you can do four pages instead of six. Or you, you, can, you can make up for it. We still have to fill 30 minutes, whether it's a big news day or not. So that means a big something might get nothing if it's a busy news day, and a really small something might be a lead story because it's a slow news day. So I'm not going to say they sit there and make it up, but they kind of make it up. And they have to. We have to fill news. you got to have a lead story. So what I have become is the best friend of the reporters. Hey, do you need a story idea today? Sometimes that's not even UCA. Sometimes it's the chamber. Sometimes it's something else that I know is going on because I'm now helping them fill their newscast. So I am their best friend because it is hard, you guys. I know you might think there's news going on, but even if there's a shooting, that's a 20 second VO. Sorry, depending on where it is. So you, VO is voiceover, a 20 second story. So you need to fill, it's about, is it 14 or 16 minutes minus commercials? no matter what. And so I'm that person that they now text, hey, it's a slow news day, you got anything going on? Guess what, we happen to have five UCA things going on and that's how I get coverage. People say, how do you get them to come up? I know their secrets. So I would encourage every news person to be a PR person and every PR person to be a news person at some point. That is the biggest advice I can get because we think differently. I used to think, what are those PR people doing? They're just lazy, they're not doing anything. Are you kidding? We had about 30 things to do before you called. And now you called and we got to back everything up. But we do it because we want the free PR, because we know how much commercials cost. <laughs> Airtime is expensive. I talk a lot. <laughs> so, that was perfect, that's right. Um, so, if you, well, we want you to leave us with one piece of business advice. So, we always end start with Ryan's with this. So, what would it be? Okay, one piece of business advice, and this is going to lead into a whole other tangent. Imagine that. When my husband went um, from part time to stay at home dad, uh, we became entrepreneurs through a business called Rodan and Fields. And I know people go, multi-level marketing. Oh my gosh, that's a scam and pyramid scheme. Yeah, it's not. Um, I thought so. Uh, I didn't even know that a pyramid scheme, in order to be a pyramid scheme, there has to be no exchange of product. And those are illegal. So I educated myself on it. And we joined. And it's mainly because I have um, horrible skin issues. Isn't that funny? I have acne like crazy. And it's the only thing that ever worked. So I knew it worked. And we got behind it. Um, we did this four years ago. Last year, uh, 2010, they made $93 million. Uh, last year, 2016, they crossed the billion dollar mark. Um, so much so that we're no longer even a part of the Direct Selling Association. Uh, that's risky. DSA is a great organization, but we kind of got too big. So it's been fantastic. But what I've learned through that, and I was talking to somebody earlier about people don't just say, you probably do good in that because you used to be on TV and people recognize you. Okay, somebody might shake my hand, but they're not going to spend money with you. That has nothing to do with it. There was another anchor, actually, that was also in Rodan and Fields. And quick, because I think she thought it'd be a lot easier. I think she thought that, you know, my name would be enough. And it's not. You still have to work your tail off. But what I've learned through that and through UCA is my people-pleaser issue. I want to please everybody. How many times do we have to hear it? It is not possible, especially in the business world. We have a mission, we have something that we're trying to do, and not everyone is going to like it. I'm saying this to me more than I am to you all because I'm still struggling with it and I'm still learning about it. And I get nervous to pick up the phone to talk about what I do, and I'm going, I don't know who this person is and I haven't talked to them in five years. Why do I care what they think of me? But I do, and I have had to let that go in order to be successful. I mean, it's the same that you see, you walked away from a glamorous TV job to do PR. I mean, I had to, yeah, I did. And I did it for my family. And I'm so thankful that I did. So for me personally, my personality, you may not have that issue. You may not give a darn what anybody else thinks about you, but I did. And I still do. I still struggle with it. And so for me, you will not be successful if you are handcuffed by what someone might think of me. So that is my biggest piece of advice to just go be you.